you did say that. I also yeah. promised yeah. yeah. I also promised yeah. 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 yeah.
globally. So we operate in 29 countries, uh, a large kind of territory from Ireland in the West, Russia in the East, and Egypt and Nigeria in the, in the African territory. So <clears throat> we have an enormous amount of data, so we don't have a shortage of data. We, in the last few years, were actually the largest SAP customer when it comes to data. So you can imagine the, the amount of customer data that we possess. So we are operating in this age of connected devices where uh, <clears throat> nearly everything that we have in terms of our assets will generate data and is already generating a lot of data. So, uh, and what we see today is that this data storage <clears throat> has become really marginal and processing power is increasing at this unprecedented rates. So basically, we're the verge of what we considered in Hellenic <clears throat> previously unimaginable, uh, that with the right uh, big data and advanced analytics infrastructure, we have the ability to answer pretty much any question, either from our uh, management teams or our customers or our ecosystem. So especially COVID accelerated a lot of this digital transformation, <clears throat> but including this uh, really explosion of data, that we're facing. Uh, what we need now is, in the organization is an AI-enabled intelligence to support us in searching through this data and generating actionable insights uh, for our business and our customers, which is really going to give us this competitive advantage. So uh, starting today with our reality, <clears throat> what we have in Hellenic is that we are pretty much aware that our current capability is being built on a really a fragile, uh, weak, and bandage data management foundations. And what do I mean by that is that currently our data lake is not really set for scale. And to give an example of that, our, our data growth from December 2020 of four tetrabytes is still <clears throat> uh, on, a, on a low level of 20 tetrabytes in 20, 2021. <clears throat> and that revealed really uh, for us significant performance and scalability gaps that we have to address. Secondly, uh, challenges around limited knowledge and control of our own data. Uh, for example, again, our data quality checks require three days of work, manual work for a single attribute check. So a single customer attribute check requires our teams three days of manual work uh, to validate, to confirm, and to really <clears throat> Uh, put this uh, in the system. Um, we look very much still at the past. So we do a lot of what we call curiosity uh, reporting while we should be looking ahead, doing much more of predictive uh, and even prescriptive analytics. Uh, again, there's a lot of manual work uh, being done because our business warehouse <clears throat> where you know, we store our data still doesn't support insight generation and that for us is creating a parallel um, data economy our internal data and analytics capabilities are still under very much underdeveloped um, and so on and so on so this list goes on and on and on um, but we are really honest uh, about what we have to do and where we are in this journey of, journey of being really a data-driven organization so that you know, that said, we haven't been standing still. Uh, we continue to invest in data. We continue to invest in uh, analytics and supporting programs have been already put in place to bring uh, CCH to the next level. So, which we need to uh, now need to augment with additional enablers, uh, like uh, working on intelligent platforms, setting up intelligent automation, <clears throat> reporting factory, together with a prioritized uh, data roadmap. Um, what we are seeing is several trends, uh, which will have and already are having a transformational impact on our business, uh, and data will be essential to address them. So just listing a few, which are very relevant for the SMCG industry uh, and companies such as Coca-Cola Hellenic, First of all, is hyper personalization. So we see that experience will be greater than the product. Uh, and this hyper personalization and individualization will make a difference 
to the connections that customers have to a brand. So we are recognizing that <clears throat> each customer at, at scale is uh, segment equal, equals one. So typically we used to have customer segmentation like bronze, gold, um, iron, whatever. Now we are putting uh, algorithms in place that uh, create every customer as a marketplace. So it is critical for us to know everything about the customer we can know in our enterprise and outside of our enterprise. Um, second element or, or trend is hyper connectivity, so hyper uh, connection. <clears throat> every device, every customer site, every equipment and asset that we have in the store, like our coolers, which are connected devices, will be connected. So uh, we also see that at some point, every bottle that we manufacture or distribute will be connected. Sensors will be everywhere, uh, continuously streaming data, which means that we will soon have ability to make real-time decisions in this hyper-connected environment. Um, moving on is this, what we call external intelligence at scale, which is our knowledge on external dynamics uh, and having this panoramic view of the industry of our category, which is not just the soft drinks category, but we also have now snacks, we have Costa coffee, we have energy drinks. So the wider category and how we drive value to the category with this data, uh, the local market, the competition in this market, and the customers uh, will be key to building this external intelligence at scale. Um, <clears throat> something new that we're seeing is this, what we call digital world. I'm sure that you've heard of it with this um, metaverse uh, conversations happening, we're entering into this digital world where the boundaries between physical and digital will be blurred. So how do we drive the only channel and the omniverse orchestration will be a necessity for us as well. Uh, what's also a big bet for us and a very important pillar for us is sustainability and health. So we see sustainability and health will be very, very important either from a consumer or a regulatory perspective. Consumers will make <clears throat> choices for sustainable and healthier products. And the information that we provide uh, for consumer preference for us will be key. And lastly, um, employees, our employees who are becoming co-creators as well. So we see that the roles of our employees <clears throat> in our industries will change and are changing now with the workforce embracing digital and AI enabled tools. So this, um, call it a bionic environment, is becoming uh, <clears throat> more and more and more and more important for us. So that's kind of like our reality today. This is the trend that we're seeing, which is which are disrupting us as well. And that brings us to how does how does our look tomorrow look like um, in the future? So uh, for us, it's really key to interpret such trends that will take many many shapes and forms. Uh, and to drive our vision, what we call the North Star strategy for us, which include a fully automated and forward-looking performance cockpits for our management teams, 360-degree customer views at um, the fingertips, powered by AI-driven recommendations, automated prospecting driven by AI, geospatial analysis, external data, and even web scrapping. So. <clears throat> As our data foundation, our data foundation is strengthened, we will be looking to develop new algorithms that will improve our business planning, our uh, execution, our supply chain operations, um, our customer service. Uh, we are heavily investing in automation, such as uh, robotic process automation or even intelligent process automation that will take over the rule-based tasks. Uh, to provide our teams and countries uh, to be focused on strategy formulation and execution rather than non-value added tasks. I mentioned the bionic environment where our employees are collaborating with technology. So human and machine interaction will build the strength of each of these components um, to create results that couldn't be delivered on its own. So our vision basically is to have, or our North strategy is to have a central engine, uh, which is built for scale, and it's built to last, uh, powered by the state-of-the-art cloud technology, 
where we have a data lake and not a data swamp we have at the minute to build that data ecosystem that is constantly feeding uh, internal external data from our customers our suppliers and our data uh, data agents so that will be enabled by <clears throat> uh people capability uplift we are investing a lot in bringing new capabilities in such as data scientists data citizens communities of practice etc etc building advanced analytics uh, algorithms um, and process optimization and then digitization of our platform so an example of that is a recent pilot that we did in austria with the digital twinning where we have created a digital clone of our, one of our production lines to really simulate and see uh, how we can inject machine learning because this is where really the the power comes from to get the real-time data to see how we can uh, gain some efficiencies in terms of energy saving in terms of water consumption saving etc et really looks promising and we're now looking to scale this up to more than 70 production lines in our um, <coughs> supply chain uh infrastructure so that Kind of a short about, I hope I didn't take too much time because you guys said that they have 10 minutes. Is our kind of environment uh, where we are thinking of there's much, much more behind it? I can uh, share if you're interested in how it looks like in more detail. But uh, I just wanted to give you some uh, perspective from Hellenic where we are in this journey, journey and where we're we looking for to really bring more capabilities in our organization to have this 24 7 data driven organization. And I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much. Um, that's an amazing summary of kind of the role of digital in, I suppose, like enhancing a customer experience, which I think is as well the main reason why startups would try and bring AI and ML into their mm -hmm. into their operations. But obviously, Milan, in, in the context of Coke, you're very data rich and it's on a much bigger scale. What does that look like? This is my first question to you guys. Um, first question is kind of, I suppose it's more for everybody, it's why. So if you're a founder or you work in a startup, you know, and you, you hear this, I suppose, buzzword or this, this drive behind AI and ML, what's, what's the driver of bringing that in, into your organization? What do you guys think? And this is obviously open to everybody who's joining with us virtually as well. Can I hear an answer from an attendee first? If yeah, here. no, I'm really interested because you know, at the end of the day, you folks are here because you clearly have an interest in AI. I'll I jump mean, in. So, AI, I don't really know what it is. ML, I don't really know what it is. Um, I mean, I don't have definition. But if you wanted to talk about data driven organizations, we've been trying to become one, and yet Jason isn't here because we never had a chat about this. <laughs> and he wasn't right. At all, um, yeah, he never is. Wasn't that at all? And um, so, yeah, I think in the last year, the first time I've seen employees actually recognize the power of data-driven um, information and data-driven decision making. And um, so, we're trying to move to a culture that says no one's correct unless they've got evidence, uh, which is massively challenging, even with 15 people mm -hmm. and a not very large. Well, we do have a massively large data set, but the data that we care about is not very large the data that we currently care about is not very large um, so that that's where we're at and i don't know if ai ml is even a thing for us at any point but certainly get to the point of making data driven decisions has been the most challenging thing i've ever done i mean i think that's a pretty common scenario for most organizations they want to be more data driven than they're not and at the end of the day again Keen to hear what Milan and Chief have to say on this, but there are a couple of different angles, I think, on how you look at AI as a startup or even as a large organization. And that uh, you can look at it as something that's going to be a pitch deck that we do AI because you think it'll get you investments. And if that's what you're doing, fine, it's okay. But be prepared for the fact that someone like Jason me. or an equally grumpy bastard like me, mainly me, you know, will <laughs> then go, okay, tell me how. Tell me why. Tell me why I should give you a million quid. Um, I haven't got a million quid. Neither do I. But the pitch that I did AI. But, but, but fundamentally, that whole idea of becoming data driven, it's, it's whether you are using AI as a core part of your product or you have a product or a business and you have an idea that actually AI could help. So you want to become more data driven. Can we automate some of the decision making? Can we look at how we use that data better? 
that's the sort of scenario I found myself in multiple organizations where it's like, why we have people manually doing stuff when we can automate this process. So it's, it's taking those two different angles. You can come in, be coming from the outset of going, I want to use AI to do X, and that's totally fine. Or you can be coming from the perspective of, we're already doing A, B, C, D, and F and G, and we need to figure out how to do it better. And have you ever seen anyone actually achieve that? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. But it's realistically achievable for a startup that's underfunded and Northern Ireland to achieve it then? Yeah, yes. Why? Why? Well, first of all, you need to go back right to the start and say, what data do I actually have? That determines which direction you're going to go in. There's small data, there's awkward sized data, there's big data. Most organizations in Northern Ireland do not have big data. I will stand on that hill and argue it to the end of time. People can preach to me at that one, but I know. Um, so in Martin's case, you say you've got this amount of data, but you know that the value in it is probably 10% of what you've actually got, but you keep the other currently. Currently, yeah. So what you're running at that point is not so much AI, but just a bunch of experiments on the data. And it's not necessarily machine learning or AI. It could just be statistics. It's at best cohort knowledge. At, yeah. at best. At this point. So but good cohorts and analysis can involve machine learning. And yeah. I, again, an, ar an argument I often have with people who are too focused on any type of analytics. You know, if you're talking to somebody who is a traditional statistician or somebody who's come through and is really super obsessed with you know neural nets. When you come to analyze any data, you have a bag of tools and you should use the right tool for the right data and the right question. And sometimes that will be a neural net. And as you often say, sometimes it's logistic regression. And before the old joke in machine learning is before you do any deep learning project, ask yourself, can I do this with logistic regression? Yeah. Right? It's a common question. Stats. <laughs> right? and, they can, and you can do that in an Excel spreadsheet. You don't even need machine learning at that point. No, there is a, you can't stretch it to a point where if you're doing it with large volumes of data and you're doing it in an automated manner, you could say that the logistic regression is kind of AI-ish. Well, it is. It is. It is. It's predictive. It's, it's mathematical. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. At that point, it is. And that's where it comes down to that debate about, well, what is AI? And to be honest, it almost doesn't matter. And I think this is one of the problems we've got at the minute in terms of the way startups look at it is they've seen shiny mm -hmm. and gone, we'll do shiny. Not what's the question I'm trying to answer here? How do I answer it? Mm -hmm. What tools do I need in order to answer it? Have I got the information mm -hmm. to make that that answer happen? Mm -hmm. um, and it's more about process than it is giving it a label. The, the, the problem I've seen is that the media give you the whole AI thing, mm -hmm. and it's sentient. It is. No, it's AI not. Is I'm not going, I am not going down that road again with you today. <laughs> we did that last week. Um, <laughs> but I've spoken to a number of founders, and it's first of all, what are you actually trying to do? And a lot of them don't even can't answer that. And it, it and it takes me back like 10 years when the whole Hadoop thing was happening. And I, I know I was early into that before anybody else over here. I know that. Um, but it was like, oh, well, if you throw data, it answers come out. No, it doesn't. You need to know. You need to know what you're trying to actually do. Yeah, garbage in, garbage. Exactly. In. Yeah. And the same thing is happening <coughs> over here as well with AI and ML. It's just like, oh, we've got this data. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Well, well, the answer crap. So, and the thing that's bugged me for so long about neural nets is traditionally, and neural nets are 50 years old. They're not exactly new. They're 50 years. Oh, God, they're the same age as me. Um, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, they were always to be used as the last thing when any other AI model could not give you a decent answer, prediction, classification, or whatever. Um, and they were, they were a last resort. We, we proved that out of Bell Tech one year. Yeah with the Darcy Bussell AI logistic regression versus yeah logistic regression a decision tree and a neural net and logistical regression done in Excel spreadsheet was far more re um, reliable <laughs> to give a prediction of Darcy's score based on the other three judges on strictly condensing than a neural net and a decision tree. 
I think, you know, if you bring it back into the room and talking about the startup problem, we know that there's startups on this call and startups that are want to listen back to the recording and you're asking what the startups use AI for and it's to make their product and solution more interesting, more valuable and make their offering to the customer better. So I only know two of the startups on the call and there's a couple of other names that we don't know as much about. It would be useful if you wanted to join the, the conversation, but with Leanna and Deborah, they're part of the RAISE cohort. You're both thinking about building AI because it makes your solution better to the end customer. Would that be fair? I would say that's a dangerous statement. Um, yeah, so for, for me, it's definitely about it, it's not just making it um, better, more valuable, more interesting, but um, it's going further in solving a problem that hasn't been able to be solved um, on, on its own. So, it, you know, we need the AI to come in, the deep tech to come in and help with that decision making in a way that hasn't happened to date. So it, it's difficult to kind of quantify and, and it's, it's starting with what are we trying to find, um, which is what you, you alluded to earlier in your, um, what you were saying. So I think that's kind of where we're at is, is how do we actually solve the problem using AI because human, um, human thinking hasn't been able to solve the problem to date. There's a lot of questions coming from that chat though. One thing I would say though, and while I agree with Jeff, Jace, most of the time, I think one thing to bear in mind is also what kind of field you're working with, right? So yeah, in your own ads for the last just work, but a lot of what we talk about, you know, when you're talking about the comparisons between neural ads and just regression, it's for numerical data, yeah. right? A lot of people don't have numerical data. No. Okay. So when it comes, and this is one of the things where what we've seen a massive shift in the last number of years, natural language processing, if you're working with text, if you're working with user feedback, if you're working with words, your own nets are fucking fantastic. Yeah, right? but they're still converting them into numbers. Well, they are ultimately, yeah. but it's in a way that is, you're not going to do that in an Excel spreadsheet. No, definitely not. And that's, again, dependent on the type of type of data you're working with. If you're working with audio, if you're working with video, if you're working with images, mm -hmm. AI is a very obvious way to go. If you're starting off just with numerical data and you're trying to make a better decision based on, I mean, Milan, you can comment on this, you know, Part of what Coke might want to do is predictive analytics to understand how they can have just-in-time delivery of stock to a certain distribution center to match demand in that area to maximize sales. Yes, that's based on numbers. Statistical analysis will probably be able to do that. Logistic regression will do that perfectly. Mm -hmm. If you want to gauge the importance or significance of customer feedback and their sentiment and what they're feeding back about, mm -hmm. that's an AI problem. Yeah. Or lots of people read things and making subjective decisions. Mm -hmm. You can do sentiment analysis without AI pretty easily. Yeah, yeah. 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 you yeah. can, but it's still, it's, it's, it depends on the type of data you're working with. Yeah, it does. Milan, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think somebody mentioned um, that it's more kind of a process conversation than anything else, um, which is very much true. So we're seeing that in our organization where we have developed some use cases based on AI and ML and BDAA, where technically they worked fine and they were not small investments, let me tell you that, they were really large investments to build that and bring that back to the organization. But when it came to really adoption and deriving value and um, you know delivering the outputs that everybody was expecting because it, it, it's always aimed towards improving a certain business KBI. Okay, so what we're delivering is, has an aim to improve a certain business performance indicator or somebody mentioned the problem. So we're trying to improve or solve a problem that we have today. Um, we came to a realization that many of these didn't really fit into the process. So technically they worked fine but I'll give you an example. So we have segmented execution and suggestive ordering for our sales rep, uh, reps, okay? Suggestive ordering is not used in any country, even though, you know, the data is, is valid, that the data is good, but it does simply doesn't sit in the right step of the process. So for our sales reps, it's not usable. They cannot do anything with that data, even though it makes sense. And we were aiming to, <clears throat> have an AI enabled business reps. 
so they can have this informed decision making. But it actually just didn't. We 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 failed to actually position it in the right process uh, environment, in the right process steps. And now we are trying to see how we can reverse that and make that change in order to to really <clears throat> bring the outcomes that we were looking for. So many times it's equally a process conversation rather than just a technical conversation to see what's the best method to solve of, to solve to solve a problem. We are. Still, another example is that we're still <clears throat> trying to crack our demand forecast use case, where we're looking to solve a problem of how we um, don't have shortage of stock, how we actually produce the right stock uh, for our customers, how do we improve uh, the forecast accuracy KPI. So that's the aim of the game. So improve the service levels for the customers, uh, ultimately improve the customer satisfaction levels, uh, and we are still two years on refining the data model uh, because it still doesn't produce the results that we want because there are so many parameters, internal, external, that are influencing the model that it just, you cannot scale it to 29 countries in the same way. So, um, so to that question is like, it's equally to have a process conversation uh, and also, uh, you know, um, a technical conversation, which is sitting with the people responsible for the data, like the data scientists, like the you know the BDA team, uh, but also the business uh, process owners who need to make sure that everything that we bring is actually going to sit in the right process step, uh, that the users of this technology will be made will you know will have a solution that will help them either make better decisions or it will make help them to understand um, the data better. What we want ultimately to do is to move away from data and to provide information to the business. So that's a long journey. So from data to insights, to information uh, with AI and ML, it's, it's a really long journey. Uh, and the problem is scale as well. And none of these uh, programs are <clears throat> cheap. You know, they, they, they require a lot of investments. So we need to make these investments right. We have a few examples that we did, uh, which the business fed back and said they're good, but we are still not seeing the improvements that we were looking for. So um, that's that's where we are. Uh, it's equally, again, process conversation as it, as it is technology or technical conversation. And then just going back to, and, and Joe, I know you've asked the question, and we'll come to you shortly just after this. And forgive me if I've maybe misunderstood this, but if you're not looking, when you talked about your previous example there, and um, about where the data kind of fits in and its usability and its value and stuff. If you're not looking at all the data, is there a potential that if you're only looking at some pieces of the data, which obviously takes a long time and it's very resource challenging, and um, might you come then to a biased and not wholly informed decision if you're not looking at everything? It depends on the context. I mean, it depends on the scale of the problem that you're looking at. So, Milan, to your problem, you're clearly looking at, you know, distribution in 90 countries. And one of the variables that's going to impact demand is temperature, weather, right? Is someone going to want a cold beverage on a hot sunny day? Probably, right? Are you more likely to drink a Coke in Croatia than I am today when I just had a cup of coffee because it's not warm here? You know, there's external variables that you may not have within your data set. And so in that sense, yes, because... It's a very broad question that you're asking that's impacted by many confounding variables, some of which are external. But again, it very much comes down to your business question, your business challenge. If you have a very defined use case, you need to, un you need to understand what the data landscape, what you require is to answer those questions and how much of that is in your control. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, for us, for some cases, you need to look broader at the data because there are so many variables. And in other ones, it makes more sense to have a, a representative set of data, which will you know, equally do the job. And sometimes we'll have to look at this, what we call small data, which is the human data, which is when we talk about the consumers, it's the small data that we have to understand. So it depends from use case to use case. You know, if you're looking for a promo evaluation uh, that we are developing at the minute, it has so many variables that are, many of those are out of our control because because our customers are very sensitive to the sellout data and they don't want to give that away. So it's, it's really difficult 
to have all the data sets, even if you think you're data rich. So you really need to make this intelligent um, decisions when it comes to the scope of the data that you're going to take. Okay, those are some of the questions that have come through. So Michael asked um, around if there's any opportunities for startups to feed into that, um, I suppose, digital journey that could grow on. And then Andrew came back to say, but yes, obviously they're happy to engage with anyone that kind of feeds into that. I suppose supply chain of solutions more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and then Joe as well asked a question around IT implications. Joe, if you want to unmute, feel free. If not, I can call out your question. Yeah, so um, I work in a university environment and there's an awful lot of research teams that are keen on spinning out their science and making companies. Um, and they're all very keen on using AI to build out like a product offering to take to market. What are the IP implications on that? Because technically there isn't an inventor in that case. Oh, there is. AI starts with a human. Okay. So would that then be the case of a research scientist owing ownership of IP to whoever coded their AI? If you're working for a company, then the company owns the IP anyway. Yeah. It, not the case in a university. The, um, although they, in everyone's contract, the university owns the IP, there is an equi equity split between the academics and the institution. It's 50-50 at Edinburgh, where I am. The, the question of IP in academia is always a difficult one. I and mean, uh, from past experience, it can put commercial organizations off working with academics just because of the IT or the IP complexity. If you're looking at something specifically spin out related, um, that has to be a very open conversation between the university and the founder, because if you believe that you've developed IP that yes, the university owns, that challenge then becomes very difficult in terms of saying, well, actually, I don't want to give you 50% of my IP. I figure I can just quit and go off and do something slightly different that will give the same outcome. So there has to be kind of a two-way relationship on that. In terms of the impact of AI on it, something that's being spun out of academic research, if AI is a component of it, it's just a component. I mean, the, technically, the IP is around solving the problem. So again, depending on what's being done, the machine learning model that you develop might be the absolute core black box part of your IP that makes your company valuable. But actually, the end point of the problem that you're trying to solve is really where the value of the company comes from. So it's it's hard to know exactly where the IP is, depending on the depends without knowing a bit more detail on the example. Uh, is I, it curious though that we're all using MIT stuff? Yeah, I mean, maybe the universities need to think differently about how they commercialize because we're all sitting here using MIT licenses for absolutely everything. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. You know, absolutely. and all the AI ML tools you can better on MIT licenses. <laughs> maybe the unis need to look at why. Yeah. Or UK unis need to look at why. The challenge though with that is that again. <clears throat> It depends on what the objective is. If you're in academia, mm. and again, this becomes this whole challenge between this sort of somewhat commercialization of academia in the sense that universities do have a drive to make money now, right? But it used to be in the old, good old days that used to be that, you know, <clears throat> as a researcher, your job was to publish papers yeah. and a company's job was to make money. And so if you were to partner with a company, the company made the money, you published your papers, all good. Maybe at some point you go work for the company and you get paid that way. Mm. The university is trying to put a reach through that the university is making money out of the inventor's IP is a very different chat. It's a, it's a difficult square peg round hole scenario. That again, it's that's where it, when it becomes challenging, even for a spin out scenario from a university, you can understand how a big company then working with academia it, it becomes very difficult. I haven't got a degree, don't look at me for an answer. <laughs> so. Okay, so complex then. This is really hard yeah. The one person that should be in the room isn't in the room. Can I be wrong? Oh, Timothy yeah, Brundle, yeah. 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 Um, oh, but he would not, true. He wouldn't be without you. He's a bubble. I'll answer it out. And I were all recording. Hi, Tim, how are you doing? I guarantee you would bubble, bubble, bubble. Don't worry, nobody's out there, actually. See you soon. It's good. Joe, yeah. Joe, if you have any specific questions around that, I'd be happy to chat the offline because, again, I've worked with academia a lot in different contexts. So if you have any specific questions that you don't want to perhaps talk about openly, I'm happy to have a chat. Thank um, you. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, kind of data sets and accessing data and 
how to maybe fast track that as a startup. But first of all, I see there's another question that comes through there from Michael, um, and specifically for Milan around machine learning. Michael, if you want to mute, you can walk. If not, I can just call it a question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Hi, Milan. Uh, and it was just more thinking about uh, predictive maintenance. What are you doing there for, you know, your factory processes or your vending machines, suspensing machines or whatever, rather than looking at customer data, looking at your, you know, your own factory data? Yeah, so we have started with um, using predictive maintenance. So as I, as I mentioned, we recently just piloted the, one of the lines with a digital twin in collaboration with Microsoft. Um, but we have also invested and we have deployed predictive maintenance in most of our plants where we're looking at data that we get from our OT, um, you know, the sensoring, vibrations, et cetera, et cetera, to change our <clears throat> predictive, to change our uh, maintenance uh, process to being more of a, let's say, a reliability maintenance process where you have predictive maintenance where it makes sense. You have um, run to failure where it makes sense. Um, and you have, um, you know, timely maintenance uh, programs which are, you know, developed on a time basis. Um, and that enables us to, again, back to solving a problem of uh, having less downtimes, having more SLE um, <clears throat> in the plant. So we want to improve our SLE on the lines. Basically, we want to have less downtimes. We want to understand the reasons behind the failures. So you can have more uh, optimized also stock <clears throat> uh, inventory in terms of the spare parts. So that's happening on the production floor where it comes also on the digital assets or the assets that we have in the stores. Uh, we have uh, also the connected coolers which are equipped with uh, beacons that transmit data as well in uh, near real time. So we have around over 700,000 connected coolers on the market that give our maintenance teams data around cooler performance uh, uh, in real time. So that actually enables us to do pre predictive maintenance on our cooler equipment, which is critical, especially <laughs> in the markets where you do need to have chill drinks uh, in the months that are critical for our uh, business. So uh, we'll give an example here in Croatia, July, uh, <clears throat> August and uh, June, basically make up 60% uh, of the volume, yearly volume. So it's really critical that you have equipment maintained, that you provide this customer service uh, basically near real time. So these are a the couple of use cases that we are implementing in terms of um, having more predictive models um, for our <clears throat> maintenance teams. Okay, thanks. And is has that been successful? And is that something that you're going to look at more in the future? It has been successful so far. We will be looking at extending that uh, to more of our, to our lines. We are collaborating closely with our uh, OEMs, like Crohn's, <laughs> Other, other companies as well to see what data we can already extract from the machines, and how we can bring more connectivity. So um, <clears throat> to enhance the processes as well. So we will be looking to enhance that as well and extend it. Okay, thanks for that. Do any of the founders either in the room or online have a specific question around like, any of the challenges that you guys are facing? A question, but like this one, I kind of have to do your next sort of. Oh, well, it was just a question about like uh, some of the more open AI stuff, like GPT three and Dali two or something. <laughs> in terms of like startups, even like maybe want to integrate some stuff, not seriously stuff to sort of maybe enhance marketing stuff like that. Is there anything they can do with those sort of open technologies? And what what GPT three sort of is quite interesting. It's not accurate though. What I mean, is so um, the OpenAI initiative mined loads and loads and loads and loads of documents. And basically they now have an AI system that you could start typing, say the start of the paragraph to create market copy. Okay. And it will create the market copy for you. Okay. And if you have to go back and look at it, it's, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. Okay. There's conversational AI, you've got chatbot kind of things as well that it can do. Um, 
it got I got into a very heavy <laughs> book club with the book club that I attend because uh, we were reading a book. I can't remember his name now. It was exactly a teen fiction book, but it was the best. Um, it was the best blueprint for AI ethics I've come across. I don't think they realised how important the book was. But it was really good. Book. And what I is this? I'll dig out the title. <laughs> I, I just can't remember it. It is not, it is not in my head right now. Um, in fact, I then stuck it in my bag this morning, thinking I'm probably going to mention it. I better take it with me. Um, the problem with those things is when you start getting to complexity, the, the cracks start to show. So if you put that out, out into the world, people will figure out pretty quickly that it's probably a chatbot. It's probably, yeah, it's probably good. And the thing with things like GTP3, they've consumed so much data from all different sources that <coughs> some predictions and outputs are more refined quality-wise than others. So when you start getting into niche or edge areas, the output isn't actually that great at all. Um, and it's it, very much like the way that GitHub have now gone with Copilot, now they're charging for it, which is basically you start typing a lot of code out, Copilot will start completing the code for you. You could actually start doing that with GTP3 in some, in some respect. There's a bunch of ethical questions around it, which I'm not going to go down, but have a feeling of questions coming up about the ethics of it later. Um, stop it again. Um, yeah, so in, in, it's something I was going to say to the startups in general in the room. I encourage you to do experiments. I don't encourage you to say, I'm going to do all this big AI stuff. Think of the experiments, small experiments that you can do with data first that you have. And then the next question is, if I don't have the data, where can I get it from? Is it already out there? Can I create it myself? Do I need a tool to create it for me? I'm not plugging my own company. Um, you <laughs> synthetic data. I did it for you. There you go. Thanks very much, mate. Um, and experiment from there. But don't. I wouldn't go down the road of saying I'm going to do AI and ML. Yeah, you'll probably need the tools, but you need to think about the data and the problems first, because I can hand on heart say 98% of problems that I've been told in various Zoom calls, I advise a lot of startups on this stuff, we get to the point of going, you, do, you don't need this. You don't actually need this. You'll be, you'll be paying a fortune for cloud services for data that, you know, and bandwidth that you won't actually need to spend. And I hate spending money because I'm a Yorkshireman. Um, I'm tight. That's the way it works. Um, so it, it goes back to, you know, David rightly says, the GTP3, there's these things that we can plug in. They might solve the problem. I want to do a chatbot. Okay, well, there's plenty of little frameworks out there to do chatbots really quickly, really cheaply, and you don't need a ton of data. You just need the intent of call and response at that point. You can integrate those pretty quickly. If, if it's becoming more, I have all these inputs for this customer, I want to start predicting stuff, that's a different ball game. That then becomes a machine learning process. Then that becomes a data quality process as well. And we talk about AI, but we don't really talk about data quality. I know Milan brought a lot of that at the start in his talk, which is good. My, when I say machine learning and AI, I am a data engineer. So I go from start to finish. I know the process from start to finish. Um, I know how awful data can be and what a complete pain in the backside it is to tidy it all up as well. And 80% of a project could just be cleaning the data out before you even do any analysis on it whatsoever. Um, these are the things we need to keep in, in context as well. And then you get into biased data. That's another conversation. It, it, it's really hard to do this. So the smaller you keep the experiment and get output as quickly as possible, the more you'll see what's possible and also then see what's probably more important for you as a startup to focus on. I'll give a slightly different context okay. or a slightly different thought on that. So your point on GPT-3, so first of all, taking a specific example of GPT-3, if you're thinking, could I use GPT-3 to generate interesting content? Yes, right? There's an article, was it The Guardian did an article that was just like this, the entire article was generated by AI. It was in the sense that a journalist used GPT-3 and took multiple passes at something and then edited together something coherent at the end. Mm -hmm. And actually that's fine, right? It's human in the loop, utilizing the tools that are available, generate something. 
you call it derivative because it's come from everything, but so is our entire mental mindset, the way that we think. So everything's derivative anyway. So you can use GPT-3 in ways like that. And again, it becomes a tool. And again, that kind of comes back to the question earlier around how can startups take advantage of AI and machine learning. Use, again, if this is not core IP to how your business will exist, use something that somebody else has already done. Yeah. Use an off-the-shelf service. I know you don't like to pay for cloud services, but you can use an AWS or Microsoft or a Google Cloud service for AI that costs a hell of a lot less than a machine learning engineer. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So you, you have to look at that sort of cost-benefit analysis. So if something's available off the shelf, if you want something that does text recognition, if you want something that does image classification, but it's not a core part of the business and it wouldn't add value to your IP, use something that's off the shelf. Use a cloud service. And even if you think building your own version will add significant IP, it won't. Because you will build something that's probably, it may be temporarily as good as the cloud service, but a year from now, you have spent a lot of time and effort building that thing. And then the cloud service is going to get better and it'll turn out that you've kind of just wasted a bunch of time building something that you've got to support from an infrastructure perspective and upgrades and updates and retraining and looking after model drift. So if you can, just rent this stuff or buy it. Yeah. Don't build from scratch. If you want to use AI, it's easy as well. If you are going to build from scratch for those who are brainwashed, or don't. have a no, just or, don't. or have a viable reason for doing so, so seeing why they can see what it'll bring. Like where do you start? Who, who does it for you? Who builds it? Where do you find that data? Even if you are going to build something from, from scratch, you start off by pick, jamming together bits that other people have already done. Yeah. If it's not going to be core IP, go online, find a whole bunch of examples of someone else has done done this and just tweak it. Because the AI is not the value, the output is the value. Yeah. And you're not going to patent a couple of lines of code that give you an answer to a question. You're going to patent, you're, you're not going to patent anything if you're in the software industry, but you're going to create value of a company that is basically plumbing stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that's most of what you do when it comes to data, it's plumbing. That's been for the last 30 years of my job. Could I take it down a back step in terms of a startup who knows that they're going to be generating something which is going to generate either statistics or something or, or they're going to create data that they want to then use and maybe in the future what fundamentals should they have in place as an individual as a team and an organization from day one to allow them to have manageable information when they get to a scale that it's useful and usable what's back here there other data this is our little joke so <laughs> I do. Did you crack that joke the last time? Probably. Yeah, I think you did. In finance, as you well know, input from an Excel spreadsheet, output to an Excel spreadsheet. That's how the world works. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as long as you know where the data is and how you want it to look, agree on it and stick with it. Over time, yeah, you might think, well, we need to bring this data in. I mean, that needs to be this data. That's fine and fair enough, but it needs to be managed. You know, you need to have control of data. And it, it's been an interesting watch for the last 10 years because um, 10 years, no, November 2010, I remember now because it was a slide from the last talk I did where Matt Johnson actually asked me, asked me on a panel because I cause trouble on panels, oddly enough. Yeah. Um, and the question was, if uh, came from the floor, if I gave you a hundred pounds, what, what would you invest it in? And everyone on, on the panel just went, oh, I'll put it on cloud and, and you know, cloud this, cloud that. And I said, no, data mining. Hundred pounds on data mining. And then now looking, and it's, it's interesting, Marty saying that people who got interested in the last 12 months where, I've been interested. The first data mining company I worked for was in 2002. Mm. And we were looking at Nectar 12 data, which came on one CD. That's how much they had, it was one CD. That's a lot. It, at that time it was. And they couldn't do anything with it. They couldn't mine it. You know, we could, but that, you know, the company that ran Nectar 12 couldn't. Um, now, obviously, We've got mobile phones that just churn out data, even though we don't want them to. Um, that's why we've got this thing. That's why everyone's taking interest now, 
but there's a lot of discipline around of saying the data has to look like this because you've got to feed it into something if you keep changing it it's going to break everything so starting point like i say and milan has already uh shadowed this as well it's a process it's a process thing that we're working with and you need to know every step of the process the modeling bit where we talk about ai is probably step seven yeah six or seven down the road you know by the time you've acquired the data cleaned the data looked at the data given it a first pass and went yeah don't need that column don't need that column don't need that column and then look at what you've already got and gone that's biased can't use that and then think well what do i do in order to smooth that out do i go and find more data from somewhere do i create synthetic data to smooth it out and then does the volume of data that i have warrant the machine learning i'm about to do because things like neural nets for numbers not so much in images and text and what have you you need billions of rows to make any sense out of it and if you ain't got that then you're wasting your time yeah okay but, but if you've collected millions of rows of nonsense you're fucked yes so it's As almost, said, it's, start garbage in garbage out so it's almost when you're looking at your startup and your responsibilities and your team um, taking things seriously from day one, like you you talk regularly about technical debt. This almost comes. You need to have a data officer as someone's responsibility within your team, and they'll think, no, that's far too much. Why do we need to bother with that? But as we keep saying, if someone doesn't keep an eye on this stuff, if someone doesn't instill that level of discipline in the company, the problem comes almost when it's too late. Yeah, yeah, and it, the, the, there's kind of only ten years in. That's the, the thing people need to remember. We're only ten years in to any companies thinking this way pretty much that, that aren't yeah, but, students. See, <laughs> yeah, because I remember I worked for learning. I worked for learning Tree International back in two thousand one and two, and you guys probably got their catalog arriving in the post. You would have been in their database in their Bark system as, as it was called, mm -hmm. and you would have had a yellow, an orange, or a red dot beside your name. Because they told you who you were, where you were, where you were. They, their database, their CRM system, which was the company, I think was the, the value of that company. And they used data without actually, I think, realizing it. I think they just knew they had to create something that built data for them. But the discipline you had in that company to, to use Bart properly, your bonus was affected if you didn't use yeah. the CRM. I'll, I'll, I'll say this one thing to everyone in the room regardless of what you do as a startup, your data is more valuable than your company itself. I was going to say something quite similar, and I, that's almost the thing as well. Is we sometimes get a bit, we get a bit sort of this theory, ethereal about this, right? Mm -hmm. Your value of your company and what you just said with Learning Tree, when it comes to data, the customers' details are data, okay. and if you don't have your customers' details and understand your customers' details, you know everything Milan was saying about better mm -hmm. understanding the customer. That's core data about your customer. Mm -hmm. So from the outset, and something that. We haven't mentioned yet, but I think it's really important. If you accept that data is really important in your business and as part of the value of your business, whether that's customer data or the data that you collect in order to build your models or build the product, mm -hmm. think about cybersecurity from the outset, as yeah. well as thinking about having somebody who cares about and is passionate about data. Because you, you need both those things. Because if that data is part of the value of your company, last thing you want to do is let somebody nick it. Yeah. I think there's something Naomi and I were talking about a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? It's like the input and the output is all very well. We know the input of, of MoveTrue comes from movement, but the value of MoveTrue itself is the analysis and the data of all that movement and then how to then predict and then tell someone what to do about an ACL injury and doing that kind of thing. Kiva, when I met you last week regarding um, Legitimate, it's like, Fantastic product, but I'm looking three stages behind it going data here, data there, authors, keywords, how, you know, it's going in that I can see 20 different directions. I just didn't want to freak you out. Um, so, because I've freaked my own out before, just, yeah, anyway. I just get you to on Yeah, well, I know you do, but <laughs> that's why you got me on as an advisor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <with the drama. laughs> So the data is behind everything. And I think, you remember Jackie from What's On An Eye? Yeah. 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 This was years ago. This was 2009, which is great. My website is my, and it's like, no, it's not. And I, I burst a bubble to start off with. Sorry, Jackie, if you're watching. Um, your website is not it. The data behind the website is what is What's On An Eye. Mm -hmm. So how do you take that data 
And then how do you make more money out of it than you've already got in terms of just the website and the advertising and all the rest? We, we went through a, an acquisition hint um, during the lockdown. That was fun. Oh, nice. Nice. Um, but the one thing, idiots that we are, and we never tracked in our platform was how much payment data went through it. I know, seems obvious, right? From, from partners, from third party partners. And when oh, I discovered, right. yeah, when I discovered at 11 and 45 one night with a call to our potential acquirers, uh, MA team at 7 a.m. the next morning, that it was 120 million a year going through, I went, I am an absolute idiot. I'm the world's biggest idiot. And I'm the data advocate in our business. And yet I never once thought, and we made 370 quid out of that in partner commissions. Um, so the entire business was changed overnight because yeah. it was mm -hmm. okay. Our first pay launches this Monday. But no shock there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the interesting part that's, is that's the part. The interesting part, there's two parts. This. First of all, I'm going to rip into you something chronic the next time we have a Guinness. Uh, zero no, or no, no zero. Uh, <laughs> sorry, the, the board have done your work. I have nothing left. I'm a husk. There's nothing left. There's nothing left. But, but, um, you, 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 bring, you bring us back to a really interesting point of you looked at it yourself. Uh, yeah, they they they're interested in us. There's how much credit card. There's there's as card much card value in human intelligence as there is in artificial intelligence. Yeah. That's the important thing here. There are some things you can't automate, and you don't want to automate. You'll just miss them. If you do ask me what that was, though, I would never say no. Never in a million years. No, thing is though, but the, the, there's one. It's stuff. one of those things that you know when you set out to do something, you've got tunnel vision where you want to get it. That's, if I were to look at what you, you know, what you're talking about, you know, payments through a platform, you want to know the number of people who've done a transaction through your platform. It doesn't necessarily jump out of you immediately if the value of the transaction is going to change the value of that company long term. But you can say, I have 4 million customers. And especially but somebody then goes, well, what, how much, worth how much? Should you know, really that's especially that's during the pandemic where all your customers are closed. Yeah, but they, they, they make it that's more it, interesting than a point, right? I wouldn't criticize myself if I were you for messing up something that doesn't necessarily that doesn't jump out as the most obvious. It's, and that's ten, the thing. Ten years ago, me doesn't like me. Also, right. right? Ten years ago, me going what an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but ten at the end ten of the day, years you know, ago, you wasn't listening to someone else. Who? Me. You? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ten years ago, me wasn't listening to all sorts of people. Don't <laughs> <laughs> special. But that's I wasn't thing. listening to me. So <laughs> but that's one thing to think when it comes to that: the importance of data. There is an element of you know, you're saying about your, how you embed this into a company. You almost have to embed a culture of understanding the significance of data. Yeah. Because as the data advocate, it shouldn't fall on you to figure out all the potential uses of the data. So it should be something that everybody cares about. Yeah. Everybody should be thinking about, are we collecting the right data? Are we using this data properly? And having a culture where if you understand the baseline that data drives our company, mm -hmm. everybody should have ideas about that. Or data should drive our company. Exactly. Is the thing exactly. Where most people are. Yeah. And as I say, if you take it from that basic thing, if you have a CRM system that has a list of your customers, data drives your business. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it doesn't matter if you are selling teddy bears. Like <laughs> it's at the end of the day, it's your CRM system is what drives your business, and that's data. And therefore, you need to think about how you use that data better. And that's where you know the entire field of marketing comes from. How do we use the data that we have about our customers to better sell products, sell them more stuff, sell them more stuff, right? So it's where every business is kind of data driven and to an extent. Storage is cheap. Yeah. So you can collect everything. Yeah. Too small to matter. Too small to meter. Right. Yeah. I have a question for you guys around selling data on data or data. Um, so there's an example um, that kind of comes to mind from a company that we know who has an app, there's loads of data within that, and um, that would be really informative for you know, imagine a number of parties. Is like how what are the I suppose like I get to ask this, but what are the kind of like ethical implications behind selling that data on? You it's know? not even ethical implications, it's legal implications. Yeah, okay. show me your data production impact like assessment. Yeah, it's it's what would the company policy it's on it. Yeah, it's yeah. what the terms of in most cases it's not their data, it's the company's data. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And yeah, people don't understand. For those 
I will say, like you said about Kiva and the legitimate, like there's so many avenues that she could go down. You know, and obviously, like we're talking about how time intensive and resource intensive it is to even experiment on a small scale yeah. about what the value could be. And then you look and what about right, what is giving the most value to my business, blah, 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 all of that. You know, are there opportunities for in those types of circumstances to have, you know, selling of the data to someone who can make value out of that and, and, and use that? I just am at this point in time, becoming a data broker is probably not something you should have high up in your list. It's too late in the game. It's, it's too late in the game, but also it's just become so toxic yeah. that it just, unless unless you're able to stand over and say, I am using this data in an incredibly ethical way, which will save the planet and end war, then it's a very difficult position to be in because of things like Cambridge Analytica and the data mm -hmm. brokerage services that they work with, we've seen too much bad stuff about this. There are, I can clearly see ethical ways in which one could collect data to use it for benefit. But if you were going to do that, you would have done it right from the start. You would have collected yeah. that data with a data protection impact assessment and privacy notice. It was very clear on all of that. Mm -hmm. The user would have understood what the data was being contributed for, how it was going to be sold on, how it may be used. Again, unless you're going to go to those lengths of making it clear from the outset, just don't do it. That's the dark side of SaaS companies, right? I get if, if you're if you're being upfront about it, it's not the user's data, it's our data. It was never your data. You rent that's, you rent the space on the server part. But that's how social media works, right? The old yeah. adage, you know, if you're not paying for product, you're out of product. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's plain and, and simple. And, and this is the thing. If your customers are paying you for your product, you gotta respect that mm -hmm. because they're paying you for the product. And if you then take advantage of that user and take advantage of their data, well, no one you can't really long. stand over that one because we'll exactly we'll stop being a customer and so what everybody else is saying. Right for Google and Facebook, you know? Yeah, right, but that's they, what they have time. They've had time, but at the end of the day, they still come Even right? after the trial? Is there, exactly. is there Zuckerberg? Would you tell us the hotel you stayed in last night? No. Would you tell us where you're sitting right now? No. <laughs> but I? again, nobody's paying any of the Facebook, right? That's true. Yeah. So at the end of the day, if I, if I were to, I don't use Facebook, but if I did, I would do it on the full understanding that I get this for free, so I'm paying them somehow. Yeah. And yeah. there is, there has to be that understanding. If you're using a free product, you're paying for it somehow. But the recycle data is not. Yeah, it's it's just a no-go edit. And is it does it become wasted then? If if some if you know founder doesn't have the resources to use it, to use it or do anything with it, like we're talking about really early stage folks that probably don't can't afford to build. It's worth holding on to though. It's one of those things that you'll find out three years down the road there is actually value in it. But you just needed something else to come along to correlate it with something else. You know. Once you start taking data sets and going, okay, we've got this, and we've still got this, how can I tie the two together and is the value there? Once you go through those experiments a number of times, that's when you start seeing data. Not everything is apparent right away. You know, there's data I've still got on drives from 10 years ago, thinking this is going to be used at some point, you know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> just, the way, just the way my brain works, you know. <laughs> That's the yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we've got all this yeah. forever. Yeah. So the so, recommendation would be to keep it up. So oh, yeah. Can be, okay. yeah. Right. It's Rusty data. That's what you want. Rusty if, data. If, if you treat yeah. company as a data asset, in the same, well, whether, whether, whether the asset is, is shared with the company, people, building, data is the same. Yeah. yeah. And, and like I say, if, if you sold that data on and effectively get, you know, there's now two copies of it and you sold your own company, they'll go, well, you know, has anyone else got this? Oh, yeah. So, all right. Deal's off. But the thing is, is if you don't, selling data would be a very extreme thing, right? But there are commercial models by which you can commercialize and make value from data that you own without being unethical and without selling your data. I mean, a perfect example is 23andMe, the genomics company, yeah. who, you know, just take a wee swab in your mouth, send it off to them, they sequence their genome and have all of this information about you. And they don't make the money from the 100 quid that you pay for getting that sequence of done. That is, they run at that at a loss. The actual laboratory processing costs more than you pay them. They get the money because they work for pharmaceutical companies who ask them questions and they're able to give them answers. Yeah. When they don't sell the data, the data is never handed over. To the company and again they're, they're very clear and very open in how they do this mm -hmm. and in a sense you know their organization like google is exactly the same google doesn't sell you the data 
but they use their algorithms and that data to ensure that your advertising works better. All right, so you can use your data in a commercially sensible and ethically sensitive way without ever considering being on a data broker and just hand it over on a single <coughs> drive to JS who will keep it covered forever. Yeah, it's a CS type promise that it's yeah. value. Oh, yeah. And does anyone have any more questions? We'll wrap up shortly. Do you have any questions as well um, on money? By all means, just write. Well, it was um, the two sides of the coin from JSN from Milan in terms of those experiments, how long those experiments might take and the cost behind them, particularly from the startup side. The small experiments is what they want to do. They want it to be less costly, but it'd be also interesting to hear from Milan, you know, those larger experiments and innovations that you're talking about from an AI and ML, those projects, you know, some timelines, if you can talk about those, how long those would take, you know, just to compare. Mm. Yeah, so from the larger kind of projects, they were between six to 18 months to deliver. Um, if you look at the deployment cost per business unit or country, typically they were be running around 150,000 euros per country to deploy a use case. And, and then down to the smallest experiment, you know, that a lot of our startups might be thinking about, well, we've got this set of data, we'd like to run an experiment on that and implement that and maybe get some usage out of that. You know, is it still six months? I know that's the question. Um, a lot of you know, these guys um, are starting uh, to build the AI in, you know. I think you, there are certain things you could sprint out in a week or two. I mean, I'm, I'm talking quick. And as Austin rightly pointed out, you you leverage the cloud tools that are there because they're dirt cheap. You know, you don't want to be spending more than a 10 or 30 quid on the sheep experiment to say, yeah, this is going to work or no, it's not. If you're spending more than that, then it's a problem as far as I'm concerned. And when it starts, when you're hiring people to do these kinds of things, then obviously it gets really expensive really quickly. And I don't think there's any point. I actually agree with Austin. If you can, if someone can guide you on how to do it on cloud infrastructure, um, do it that way. Um, I wouldn't start wasting huge amounts of money, especially in, in the way startups are. They don't have, you know, they may not have many customers. And, and the revenue is the most important part of keeping the business running, not wasting it on, on experiments on AI that just might not even bring any value in the long term. And to, in terms of the time scale it takes to do something like that, the majority of the time that it takes to do anything with data is you spend 80% of your time cleaning and fixing and yeah. curating the data. If you have a database that you've got that you're doing something with anyway, that's already fairly clean and nice, mm -hmm. the amount of time it might take to carry out an experiment with a machine learning model might be an hour. Yeah. Right? You can take an hour or a couple of hours with a good data set and answer some questions. Mm -hmm. I've seen guys on my team do that where they're like, hey, this might work on the block check, but we'll back away, it work. Or it didn't look, we've just predicted chronic heart disease. And you know, yeah. they can do that in a weekend because the data sets that we have for that purpose are really good. But if you're starting from scratch with the, I've got a mountain of data and don't know where to start, it's a completely different setting. So but you know, you can do quick, easy experiments to find out if you can get value. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, as a, as a, a rough gauge, the, the, there's a, a model called YOLO3, which is an image recognition model. It took, I think the, the data set sounds quite small. It was only like, it was less than a million images, which doesn't sound like a huge amount. It took eight days, eight full days of fairly major hefty machinery to do the training just to get the model out. It's not a cheap thing to do when you start doing it yourself, um, which has kind of come out of the conversation earlier on, both from Milan and from Austin. So it's how to reuse those things. So things like transfer learning where you actually use existing models for your own benefit yeah. is, is a better way of doing things and a cheaper way of doing things um but in terms of small do-it-yourself projects experiments yeah cl cloud is probably the better way to go yeah. and for a startup if they were in a position to like be that next hire for them to go into the ai to the machine learning to get somebody in focus on that what do you actually think as a job is the most ideal person to bring in if you're going to have somebody to really focus just on the data is it a data engineer is it someone to clean the data and then move into the algorithm like where is the most key hire for a startup it depends what you already have in place yeah if you have a really good software engineer who 
can get their heads around doing some data engineering, you might just want to do data science. On the, and, it, and it depends on how much value it's going to be. On the other hand, if you have a really good software engineer, you could bring in a junior software engineer with an interest who wants to teach themselves a little bit. Mm -hmm. And actually that might be enough because again, it depends. I've spoken to startups who are like, oh, I really need to hire a data scientist and you talk down, sit down and talk to them and go, you need somebody to develop a model for you once. And then you, the engineering team are going to put this into production. And then retrain it. Yeah, better retrain it once in a while. But once it's done, once the hard bit's done, you actually need to hire somebody for three weeks to come in and do this, and then they can go away again. So it depends on how much you're going to do this and how core it is to your business, and also who you're really helping. And if it's a potentially quite a large data set. What type of data is it? Mm -hmm. But is it like from accelerometers? Is it video? Uh, no, no video. Just all sensory technology. Sensor. Okay. I, I mean, if you're talking IoT type sensory type data and it's quite high throughput, that's going to be fairly complex data. Yeah. So you're going to want to want somebody who actually knows how to play with data. Yeah, that right. one's going to be harder. Yeah. So yeah, get a data science. <laughs> 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 Not that one. <laughs> Hard data. <laughs> what, I've learned, what I've definitely learned is right, the value of unit tests yeah. and passing tests and mm -hmm. software engineer so that you don't get garbage going in. Mm -hmm. That is the critical thing because you can have all the data scientists in the world, and if you've got a bunch of bad software engineers and the tests are failing left, right, and center, you have no idea what you're putting in play. Yeah. Little things like integers matter. Yeah. Little things like yeah. one plus one equals two really, really matter. Yeah. You know, so we found that a good lot of our data in the early days was complete or garbage and totally unusable, which was fine because we weren't trying to do anything with it. But thank God we found out before I was sitting here today trying to do something with it yeah. and trying to predict predict time, mm -hmm. which would have been impossible with the, the data previously. Now it was because of some choices that we made in everything. Yeah. You know, but the, it's, it's getting the whole, I, you know, listening to Jenny's question there, and I'd say six months, six weeks, six days, six hours, getting the buy in of people who understand why you're doing this is the hard part from, mm -hmm. organizational, from an organizational perspective, getting people to actually just. Does everyone know where I like it? Oh, yeah, it sounds like a great idea. Oh, yeah, it sounds like a great idea. Oh, yeah, it sounds like a great idea. But you have those little light bulb moments where they go, wow, that actually worked. Yeah. Wow, I actually made a decision based on that. Wow. You know, those little light bulb moments are the, the important thing for me. Yeah. As, as I think as well, depending on what you're trying to do, that skill set can be very diverse. Because I can make a simple statement like get a good data scientist. Mm. But Right Some of the best data right. scientists that I've worked with have PhDs in physics. Yeah. And I will stand by that if you're working on hugely complex problems that require really deep thinking and a real deep mathematical understanding, get a PhD physicist, right? They're yeah. awesome. On the flip side, if it's implementation type work, honestly, a software engineer who's done a master's or a bridging course or even a Coursera course actually probably out you as much. Probably I understand. You depends. Um, <laughs> I understand. You. There's this, your one call. But again, this is a, that's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. supporting your point because at the end it of the day, the, the physicist won't be thinking unit tests. The software engineer will be. Right. So when, when I wrote the first book in 2014, no is one was talking. Is that that one or is that another one? Well, that's the second edition. This, 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 this is the second edition. That's the second edition. Oh, okay. Both available in good bookshop. And, and bad one. Um, <laughs> And the, the unsigned copies are rarer than the signed ones. Mine's <laughs> <laughs> um, not signed yet. He's, he's upset already. Um, no one was talking about this. Okay. And look at what's happened between 2014 and 2022. We're all talking about it. Um, the tooling is light and day compared to you're not needing software engineers to write this stuff now it's the tools are there go use them you know and every stumbling block that i've come across with any startup that i've spoken to has been around the data not the actual processes it's all around the data so marty's right milan's right and, and you know everyone that's commented on data quality is absolutely right um it starts there more than anything the ML bit is actually quite simple now because it's a commodity, you know, and we'll get to the point where it's fairly ubiquitous. It's just like data, throw it somewhere, does the work, or not go. Um, and you still think of data science, do the data quality? Yeah, yeah. Um, a data scientist is an important person in terms of the person who understands the quality of the data and what it means. Because as long as that data scientist 
agrees that the data engineering part and the data quality is incredibly important. Yes. Because I've come across data scientists that will go and write a Python model but not give two hangs about how the data looks. Yeah. And therefore you've then got a model that's just full of crap. Yeah. Um, does anybody else online or in the room have any final questions? Or if not, um, Milan or Cindy, if you have any final comments for everyone, I, yeah, um, I, I can't think of any. I think you've shared enough there. I think we'll have a lot of food for thought. Something will happen on the way home when I'm driving, and I'll think about it. And I'll think it on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, sorry. No, I'll just go sit up with the book. Get the kids' book. Sorry? Kids' book. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's like, oh, my God. Um, I did write a medium post. I also have a really good cartoon based on one of the things that you just said around data quality. It was about trying to find it, but saying find it and forward it to you later. Yeah. Um, would it be fair to say you're happy to be consensus if anybody does have any further questions? Yeah, yeah. And, and honestly, I think you know we're, we're trying to give broad answers that are applicable to everyone, or at least hopefully it leaves a little bit insightful to everyone. But at the end of the day, sometimes it's, you know, the answer to your question is really, really dependent. So again, I'm all back to have a chat with people who want to support. Thank you very much. Just follow you online as well. Brilliant. Shows you. who you are by L. McNichol. Shows who you are. Okay, brilliant. We'll, we'll take a screenshot. We'll share that out. Yep. Um, Fabulous. Well, thank you all very much. Um, another kind of a successful Reels event. I hope you all got a lot of value out of that. Um, taking a bit of a hiatus for our event the next couple of weeks. Um, just to give us kind of a way of summer. We have our weekly coffee mornings tomorrow with the brew crew. Um, and then we'll take a bit of a pause until the end of July. So we're actually launching the very first summer school this year. Um, it's an emerging leader summer school. Really exciting. It's all around kind of softer skills and leadership and uncovering that um, leader, that inspirational leader that you all kind of need to be in your role as CEO and founder. So we'll be sharing more information on that shortly, um, but everyone's very welcome to find out more or anything. I'm hoping to see you again at the Reels event. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank to you. our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I have a female, a female founder who want to help me out. I have a female founder calling the group tomorrow. If you need some help, you want to help.